dando continuidade à nossa programação e realmente já abrindo o nosso programa técnico, eu gostaria de solicitar a atenção de todos para a nossa palestra de abertura. A nossa palestra de abertura deste evento, Estratégias e Ações sobre Resíduos para Cidades Sustentáveis, será realizada pelo Dr. David Newman. Dr. David Newman é vice-presidente da ISVA, a International Solid Waste Association, e nos brindará com uma apresentação que tratará de uma série de fatores a respeito da questão das ações possíveis em âmbito local que realmente, em sendo adotadas, trarão consideráveis benefícios e resultados concretos em âmbito global. É um grande prazer contar com a presença do Dr. David Newman aqui conosco, e eu gostaria de convidá-lo ao palco. David, please, it's a great pleasure to have you here and uh, have your presentation for us. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. I, I want to thank you personally for your fantastic hospitality here in Rio de Janeiro this week. And to thank the audience and the friends that we have in the audience here for listening to me today, I really am very sorry not to be able to speak your beautiful language. And I'm looking forward to the final in Rio de Janeiro in 2014 between Brazil and England. But I'm not going to bet on the result. Now, let me see how this works. Does it work? Over there, yeah? Okay. All right, what I'm going to do in about 20, 25 minutes, because we're running behind schedule, is I'm going to try to take you through some of the global factors and the environmental aspects which impact the world from waste and then look at some of the local actions and some examples of what can be done to improve the situation. Now, I know that I am talking in this room to a lot of people who are probably as expert or more expert than I am. So I am not coming here to teach. I am coming here simply to bring experiences which I hope may be useful because I know that many of you already know these experiences yourself. Well, this slide is probably the slide which has been most seen in Rio over the last two weeks, the population boom. I don't regard it as a, a bad thing. I regard it as a challenge and an opportunity. And if you consider that the biomass of ants, the biomass of ants is actually three times greater than the biomass of human beings, I don't think we should panic about population increase but we should try to create the same efficiency in our society as ants. They don't pollute, they don't create waste, they are not obese, they don't throw away food, they do a lot of things for the environment. So it's a question of organization and it's a question of common objectives. A lot of what is happening in the world is of course that in countries like Brazil, a lot of people are consuming more because they're getting richer. This is not a bad thing. This is a very good thing. This is exactly what we have been trying to achieve over the last 50 years, that people come out of poverty and people consume and improve their lifestyle. Because we wanted those dollars to start moving from the north to the south, from the west to the east. And we should be very happy that we have achieved this. But it comes as a price. It comes at a price and it is that price which today we are looking at resolving. The price is, of course, that waste is everywhere, and as countries get richer, they produce more. 
On this map, you can see the dark areas, which are the very wealthy countries of the United States, the Nordic countries, where waste production is over two and a half kilos per day per person. And the lighter colored areas, where the production is still less than half a kilo. We are producing, ladies and gentlemen, today around about four billion tons of waste. To be honest, we don't really even know how much it is. It's a guesstimate. And probably around about 1.2 or 1.5 billion tons of municipal household waste. If we look at the, the green part in the pie chart here, we can see that the composition of waste changes as your wealth changes. So the green part, which is the organic waste, is a very high part of waste in low-income countries, whereas in the high-income countries, it becomes much, much smaller. What is happening is, of course, that as people move to the cities, so the production of their waste changes. A rural farmer in India is producing 80 kilos a, a year. Someone sitting in Manhattan is producing almost 800. You in Brazil are halfway along that graph, and it is clear that your trend is upwards and not downwards. It's also clear that that's what you want, because you want more consumption, more well-being. The consequences of this in terms of CO2, and I will talk about greenhouse gas emissions now with you for just a few minutes, are devastating. And it is above all the greenhouse gas emission consequences which I will look at. The World Bank described the waste emergency as grave and as important for mankind as the climate change emergency. Here we have the cycle. You probably all know this. Virgin imports, materials, energy, and labor go in one side, and what gets produced, consumed, and comes out the other side are gases, products, waste, carbon. How much carbon? Well, according to some estimates in 2010, according to the EPA of the United States, almost 800 million tons of CO2 are being produced through waste production. That will rise to, according to some estimates, to 3 billion tons in 2050. And where will that come from? Where will those emissions come from? They will come, above all, from landfills. Although waste only, only uh, today accounts for 3 or 4 percent of global CO2 emissions, it accounts for 18 percent of all the global anthropogenic methane emissions. So it is a very, very big co contributor, and it will get bigger. It will get bigger, not because of the Western world's contribution. As you can see, the OECD contributions from, uh, of, of climate change uh, gases from waste are more or less level over the next 20 years, but those coming from the developing countries will grow enormously. Sure, there is still a lot that we can do in Europe to make ourselves better. I'm not preaching from a pulpit. I'm simply telling you this is what the situation is. I am very ashamed to see that my country, Italy, where I live, is actually the second biggest emitter of CO2 gases from waste treatment in Europe. So we still have a long way to go before we are perfect. If we recycle our waste, and we will see later the example of what the Netherlands, a world leader in waste recycling, is doing, we can save enormous amounts of CO2 from simple recycling of our paper, our aluminium, our steel, glass, and plastic. Here are simple packaging waste calculations. Depending on which part of the world you're in, and depending on upon how they are produced, you can save, if we look at just paper, according to the EPA, one ton of paper recycled saves enough energy to power an average American family home for six months and save 7,000 gallons of water and landfill space, etc., etc. There are enormous benefits from recycling. We know that, and in Europe we are doing it already, and in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions, 
I'm very proud to say that in 2008, we are at all, almost 50, we were 50 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions lower than in 1995. And that if we go towards the full implementation of our landfill directive, which bans organic waste and non-treated waste from landfill, we will be down to about 120 million tons of CO2 per year less emitted into the atmosphere. Okay, so we know that. We've seen the examples. You will see this calculation done by the Netherlands later, and we know that that is possible. We also know that everybody agrees that that's possible. In the, in the Shanghai Declaration, in which cities around the world during the Shanghai Expo made the declaration on better cities and better life, you all signed up to that. Sao Paulo and Rio were there too. And you all said that for sustainable development, we need to use our resources more efficiently. Which wastes should we focus upon? Well, of course, I believe in your situation, the biomass is fundamental. It is 60% of your waste stream, and it is readily there to be able to be intercepted. But also paper and cardboard, plastics, ferrous metals, and of course, e-wastes. This is a challenge, but it also brings enormous benefit. If we look at just the jobs market, we have created we create 400, we had 400 jobs per million inhabitants in 2000 that rose to 600 jobs per million inhabitants in 2007, and that will rise another 50% by 2020. So waste recycling creates sustainable jobs. But if you can't go down the recycling road, at least you can do a lot of things, and Rio de Janeiro knows this. We were with Jose yesterday and he showed us the new engineered landfill in Rio de Janeiro, you can at least take your biogas from the landfill and stop it going into the atmosphere. You can probably only capture 50, 60 percent, Jose, of the biogas, but at least that's something you can do. It reduces emissions, it creates energy, and you can replace uh, fossil fuels with the energy coming from that. But I return to say that I think the road forward, both in greenhouse gas emissions and in waste recycling and in the creation of jobs, is intercepting the organic fraction, taking it out of landfills, composting it, producing fertilizer products, which you can do on a local scale, you can do on a domestic scale, and you can do on a city industrial scale. Let's look at Austria. Why have I chosen Austria? Well, for two reasons. It's, it's where our head office is. And it's about six, seven million people, which I suppose is comparable to the size of Rio de Janeiro. If you can look at the map of Austria a few years ago, you will see all the waste recycling facilities which there are. And here on this map, this is just the packaging waste recycling facilities. This is not the composting facilities. This is not the incinerating facilities. You can see how waste recycling in Austria has created lots of facilities Lots of investments, lots of jobs. And the consequences of that, in terms of the environment, in terms of resources, has been to go over 20, 25 years from 60% landfill to zero landfill today. So zero landfill is possible. It takes time and it takes investment. But it can be done and has been done in many European countries. The Netherlands will show you also how they have done that there later. It is, it is essential, however, if you want to recover resources, we found in Europe that the only way you can recover them is through very good source-separated collection schemes. In Austria, they have done this in various ways, both in large cities and in rural areas, where collection schemes cover households, uh, groups of households, as well as uh, drop-off points for various types of waste. The benefits of that in terms of emission have been enormous. They are now a net saver of greenhouse gas emissions indirectly. Of course, everyone's going to say to me, well, who pays for that? And no one wants to pay. The industry doesn't want to pay because they say it's not our problem. 
and we introduced in 1996 the packaging directive in Europe in which we said, well, we're sorry, but who puts materials into the market pays. It's the polluter pays principle. And that has been applied throughout and being applied throughout Europe today. In, in Austria, it, we have a dual system. And we oblige companies through extended producer responsibility to pay to get their materials back into the economy. We charge, of course, communities. There are waste fees, there were landfill taxes, there are incinerator taxes as well, to all to go to encouraging recycling. I noticed in the presentations this morning here, not one person spoke about money. Everybody spoke about policy, everybody spoke about partnership, everybody spoke about cooperation, but no one said, who's going to pay? And I believe, from the European experiences, that we all have to pay if we want to go down this road. There are, of course, some alternatives. Uh, there's overseas development aid. There's the international donor system. I believe that Brazil is probably a, richer, a rich enough country to be able to afford to pay for its waste management itself. But certainly, some of the poorer countries in Latin America but around the world need development aid to get their systems up and running. Now, if we look at the enormous amount of development aid which is put into developing countries, $164 billion in 2010, the amount that was spent on waste, I mean, wouldn't even buy us all a pizza tonight. It's tiny. It's a small amount. And really, the, the message that we want to get across and that with our uh, partnership with IPLA and UNEP and the United Nations Development Program, with our uh, relationships with the World Bank, must be that this financing has to be put into place urgently if we want to overcome the waste emergency around the world. We're going to need a minimum of overseas development aid of $10 billion a year by 2020. That will stimulate huge amounts of investments also from private sector and from local governments, and we will start to get our waste problems under control in the rapidly developing countries. Our case for this is, is solid. When we go and lobby donors, the World Bank, the, climate, the Green Climate Fund that comes uh, into, into, uh, into existence now, our case is really solid. We have economic benefits, we have huge environmental benefits, and we have great social benefits. The way forward, ladies and gentlemen, is the recycling economy with jobs, to guarantee urban hygiene, to reduce emissions, to recover resources, and to create energy. It's not a fable. It's not a story. It's happening in reality in many parts of the world. And I want you to think about, when you go away here today, how you can help to join us in this campaign, how you uh, can make a real difference for a cleaner environment, how you can become an environmental activist, because waste management today is environmental activism. It's about making the environment a better place to live in. So help us, ladies and gentlemen, in our campaign to create a sustainable world uh, management system worldwide. Join us in our annual conference if you can. In, uh, I know many of you will be there in Florence this September. And if you can't, with Albrelpi, the National Association, but also with ISVA, join us. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your very inspiring words and uh, for the thoughts that you brought to us, making us really and deeply think on how we can move on the waste management. Senhoras e senhores, nós teremos uma pequena alteração na ordem do programa desta manhã. E eu gostaria de, uh, agra já agradecendo a presença, convidar a uh, o secretário de Estado de Infraestrutura e Meio Ambiente do governo da Holanda, juntamente com o diretor da Associação Holandesa de Resíduos Sólidos, para nos apresentarem os resultados de um estudo inédito que foi realizado a partir dos dados do Brasil e que trata da redução das emissões de CO2 focando nos benefícios potenciais do setor de resíduos 
no país. I'm very glad to invite uh, the Secretary of Infrastructure and Environment of the Dutch government, Mr. Johannes Jan Jup Atzma, to come to the floor uh, and give us some words about the study that has been done uh, about the emissions on the solid waste field uh, and the benefits for the Brazilian market. I thank you very much uh, for your support, for the secretary's support to carry in this study, uh, which I, I'm sure that will be a landmark in the Brazilian waste management field. I also invite Mr. Eric de Bas, uh, who is the director of the NVRD, the Dutch Solid Waste Management Association, is a national member in the Netherlands, who uh, has uh, deeply cooperated with this uh, interesting study. Thank you very much for coming, and please, uh, it will be a pleasure to hear you. Ladies and, uh, and gentlemen, I'm, I'm delighted to be here at this seminar. And um, waste, waste is an important issue and a major part of concern for people and planet. We all know that. And waste management is one of the answers to the, change, to the challenges we face. And all over, all over the world, people are uh, devising more ways of making new products from waste um, materials. I think later on we will, hear, we will hear a lot about it. And recycling is set to increase as raw materials become scarcer and more expensive. And reducing waste will help us to, take, to tackle climate change, environmental uh, degradation, and thanks to, uh, and, and threats to the biodiversity. But it's also an economic challenge. Let's say it's a green challenge. It's a green engine. And I'm proud to say that the Netherlands has, has one of the best records in Europe for recycling. We are, and I'm really proud of that, we are a front runner. And not only in Europe, but I think we are a front runner all over the world. Our waste sector is professional, internationally orient orientated and innovative. And the results are impressive. In 2000, 2010, around 80% of waste was recycled in the Netherlands, and 70% incinerated, and only 3% landfilled. I think if you realize, realize what that means, then there's only one conclusion possible. It's a fantastic record. And new waste legislation uh, shifted the focus from final disposal towards recycling. And it will go on. And all this gave a boost to our waste sector. And the Dutch recycling sector has, has seen its turnover ground by more than 300% since 2001, 2002. So in 10 years' time, more than 300%. And ladies and gentlemen, Brazil has seen a strong economic growth in the past few years. And I, it now recognizes the need for environmental policy and legislation coupled with enforcement and education, of course. And this is seen as essential for the country's further economic and social development. And I fully agree with that. And new waste legislation in Brazil has changed the focus from final disposal to recycling. And a good example of Brazil's uh, ambitions, uh, recently one of the uh, biggest, largest landfill in Rio de Janeiro closed. And after August 2000, 2014, all valuable waste, all valuable waste, will to be uh, collected and recycled. 
only residual waste will be landfilled. And I think that's a good and excellent signal. Ladies and gentle, gentlemen, I have, uh, I move to the results of a study that uh, was uh, carried out by, uh, uh, it was carried out to, to survey Brazilian waste management potentials. And we were proud that um, a Dutch professor, Professor Warrell from the Uni University of Utrecht, uh, headed this study. And we asked him to calculate the, base, the basic no waste management uh, scenario. And we also asked what would happen if Dutch available technology would be ap applied to the uh, huge Brazilian waste volumes. And then the results. The results are highly impressive. Today, Brazil produces over 60 million tons of municipal waste. And in processing the waste, Brazil produces over 16 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. This is likely to double by 2030. Luckily, new Brazilian uh, waste law will turn this around. Will turn this around into net savings of 28 million tons. Indeed, 28 million tons. And thanks to increased recycling techniques, landfill gas recovery, and new technology. And these savings, these savings could even be doubled if Brazil increases recycling even further and uses new techniques, other technology, like uh, more um, energy efficient anaerobic digestion, etc. And I think, I think that can be very, very important for this country and also for this area and for this city. This leads to energy savings equivalent to a full month of Brazil's uh, total oil production every single year. Indeed, indeed, energy savings of a full month of Brazil's total oil pr production every single year. And these huge potentials for greenhouse gas reduction can be realized with experience from the Netherlands, experience, experience that drains raw waste ma management uh, and produces and practices to uh, new techniques. I think that is very, very important. And I conclude that the technology is available. And we all know that it's available. It's available in the Netherlands, but it's also, also available, available in a lot of other countries, including uh, Brazil. So the, the technology is here, and the financing and exchange of knowledge uh, Will, being of, will be organized. I think that in that uh, way, cooperation between countries, cooperation between the Netherlands and Brazil will be very, very essential. And we should aim for more ambition targets because good is not good enough. And I think that today, this seminar will give a boost to all the new uh, ideas and new technology that will be possible for the next, let's say, five or 10 years. And we all know there's a lot possible. And what is possible that will be uh, cleared up by the study done by the professor from Utrecht. And in my opinion, there's enough, enough food, food for thought uh, today. And as far as I can see, Brazil, go further on this way. It's very, very interesting what you're doing now, and I hope that the use of new techniques, the use, the use of new technology, and everything that's uh, here has to, be, uh, has, to be, has to be used because the ambition to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions is for Brazil, for the Netherlands, for all the countries all over the world, like we have seen yesterday and the day before at the Rio Plus 20 conference, very, very important. Thank you very much, and I hope that you have a lot of good ideas here to uh, create that common future. Thank you.
And now, thank you, Mr. Secretary. And now I'm glad to invite Mr. Eric Debas to present the results of the study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. And thank you very much, Mr. Secretary of State, for um, the words shared. Um, also, molto obrigado for the excellent translation that made me understand the wise words of the speaker earlier in the, in the program. Um, I trust um, my, uh, my English words, I'm sorry I will not be able to speak in Portuguese, will be translated uh, well in Portuguese too. Um, it is a great honor for me to be here, and I will uh, gladly follow up on the words of uh, our Dutch Secretary of State. I'm proud uh, to be able to show the Dutch results, but I'll also be wearing uh, the hat of President of the um, Association of Municipal Waste Europe, showing you the European figures, and of course a board member of ISWA. So I will start with, uh, if you allow me, with um, the um, yeah, with a short agenda, um, going over the global scope, and then zoom in to the European and the Dutch results. When we look at sustainability, uh, I will briefly show you the relevance of waste management and the incredible impact it can have. Whereas many who are not knowledgeable in waste management think, well, it's only about maximum 5% of the problem, they don't realize that it's 20% of the solution. 18% of the EU Kyoto targets are being met by waste management and recycling. So when we think about the problems in the future, the waste management has an immense, uh, immensely important role to play. And when we think about green economic, economic development and the role of waste management, I'll gladly show you later on how waste management is in a unique position with a cross-cutting impact throughout all business sectors and all, our, all households. And then we will show you the European and the uh, Dutch results, also with a view to their potential in Brazil and other emerging markets. When we look at the global situation and we look back, we see our economic um, process. This, ladies and gentlemen, is, a project, is uh, the past how in America, we all want the American way of life when we're not in either America or Europe. This is what we, what we envisage. So if you look at these lines, you'll see on the left how long it took for a telephone to penetrate in the households of Americans. You may recall uh, landline phones. Those were the ones where you'd be sitting on your couch next to a table, you couldn't move, you couldn't be outside, you were just hoping that your family member or your friend would be at home too and could answer the phone. It took 70 years before such technology penetrated in the households of America. Then later on, of course, with a view to our food, once the refrigerator was invented, it only took 30 years, if you see that line there, before that was penetrated. Because, of course, our food, that's what we want uh, to, to be kept, and the refrigerator went fast. Recently, the color TV, we may not need it for our food, but we spent too much time watching it, only took 20 years to penetrate in the, uh, in the households in America. And more recently, we don't use the landline anymore. Looking at the cell phones, who can imagine uh, living now without a cell phone, also here at, at Rio Plus 20? It took less than 10 years before it was penetrated 90% in the American households less than 10 years. And the same is happening in Latin America, even in Africa. Who, who would have thought that, uh, much more importantly than a refrigerator, the cell phone penetrates rapidly? But when you look at the uh, consumption, of course, looking at the product cycle, you will see that after invention of an idea, taking it into production, and then the use phase, we can fairly well predict our waste. And ladies and gentlemen, when we think about all this development, all the materials we use, this is what we do with our waste. So of all these innovative products, 90% here in Brazil, 40% uncontrolled, and nearly 60% in controlled landfills goes to landfill. This is the end of our current economic process. And Asia and Africa do no better. 90% is dumped, and we see people in dreadful circumstances who live their lives based on capturing the, the scavengers, the, the valuable resources out of it. The methane emissions as a result of landfilling are tremendous, as uh, was showed by David, um, and we will get into that more uh, later. So you will clearly see that with a view to health, with a view to hygiene, 
sustainability, this is not a sustainable way to go. Now, when we look at, oh, when we look at our, uh, our planet, you will see that research showed where do we exceed our boundaries. And with a view to biodiversity, we are already in serious problems. With a view to um, uh, biochemicals, well, here you, you can see where we have problems. On, on the top, you'll see climate change. We're nearly uh, approaching the end of our uh, planetary boundaries. So it is clear that we need to change our way of production, consumption, and uh, the way we deal with wastes. Even more importantly, because recently, I think it was two weeks ago, the World Bank showed that if we look at this, this picture, climate change, World Bank said, waste is as serious a problem as climate change. With the upcoming economic development and thus the upcoming waste production, we have to seriously tackle waste. However, if you look at what we do uh, on the planet, we move from the countryside towards the cities. So we move from rural areas to urban areas. And we use many more resources because in the cities um, with much high rise, uh, there's other construction uh, going on. We live different patterns of life. And what we see here, whereas we move towards the cities, we now have more people living in cities than in uh, rural areas, and that's going to continue rapidly. Um, in these mega cities, we use many more resources. And whereas this summit, to a large extent, is focusing on energy, um, the message is that materials, of course, are just as important and even more important, perhaps, because energy makes us move, but it's food and materials that make us live. So if we have if we don't recover our materials, we come to our ends. And oh, going back, here you see if um, the economic development grows on the, on, the, on the bottom side, also our material use uh, is, is increasing. So we increase our planet even more and more with the current uh, population and uh, development processes. When you then make that uh, concrete and look at, the, uh, at, at various materials, you will see that Taken again, this American lifestyle as, a, as an example, as what people are striving for, you will see here on this side several materials that are crucial for our cell phones, for our PCs and laptops, for our electricity, are nearly coming to their end. Here is a projection of when we use this American um, uh, lifestyle as the standard and suppose all would live that way, we would only have copper for a couple of more years. Um, I think it's uh, some 35 years. Now, that's very close. Uh, but when we, um, if, if all were to, uh, to live ac according to the American lifestyle, for instance, our cell phones and our laptops, we would have some 10 years of materials necessary for these laptops, for these cell phones. This is how fast we exhaust our planet. And who could think of a future without cell phones or laptops? So we need to move towards a green economy. And if you then look at how that can be done, if we look at all these materials, textiles for our clothing, for our furniture, aluminium, the electronics, you can name any, any kind of sector, any kind of material. This is what we do. We design things. We make it into carpets, fashion. We sell it. Of course, we use it in the, in, in the consumption phase. And in the end, my friends, it all comes in our hands in the waste management industry. And what's the good part of the story? Of course, we have the knowledge, the sorting capacity, and the logistics to be able to play this green role in the green economy. We can, throughout all these business sectors, with all these materials, in businesses, in households, play a crucial role, a cross-cutting role in all these sectors towards the green economy. In fact, if you look at it as, a, as an engine, we are a key gear to promote sustainable development. And we are in a unique position. In fact, it was also UNEP in 2010 who said that the waste management industry is in a unique position, and I'll come to, back to, uh, to that later. So it is essential that we, uh, that we change the dynamics of our production and consumption process in construction, uh, in our um, offices, in our homes, uh, in the supermarket where we buy our food, and we move towards recycling of our materials. When you then look at the Recycling Society and the Economy, 
including the producer's responsibility, as we have thought of it in, in Europe, with a responsibility to take care of the products and the materials you put on the market. These materials used, they need to be reused. So if you look at that, uh, at, at that recycling society, starting with a purchase of products being uh, produced by producers through consumers, we of course have to close the loop uh, and end the red spot of disposal. Where now we have here 90% being landfilled, we need towards, to move towards the 80% being reused as a resource, like our Secretary of State so rightfully said. Then getting into the European approach. It is with, ple with, with pleasure that this European approach, the waste hierarchy that many uh, who are active in the waste management industry know about, it was invented by a Dutchman. Here you see Mr. Ad Lansing, who in the year 1979, a Christian Democrat party member of our Secretary of State, uh, invented the idea to prevent as much waste as what possible, to reuse products as long as possible if that's not possible to prevent it, to recycle the materials if you can't reuse the products. Um, if that's not possible to recycle the, um, the materials, then at least take the energy out of it uh, through either um, uh, incineration or uh, other options, and only the final disposal where we are now in the Netherlands down to 3% of landfilling. The idea is instead of landfilling, we also in the Netherlands, back in 1979 and in the early 80s, had a huge mountain of waste in the north of the Netherlands. We come from the same situation. But what happened is when you look at the, the impact of this waste hierarchy from a climate perspective, if you take it uh, bottom up, landfilling, and you move up the hierarchy, this is the CO2 impact possible. When we prevent, when we reuse, when we recycle, these are the CO2 impacts possible. But what is the European situation? So, we also in Europe still, still landfill quite a huge part of our waste. This is uh, the figures down below the landfilling. You see where we came from since 1995. And of course, we are moving towards more uh, recycling, uh, composting of our bio waste, of course, a, a huge. Uh, uh, element here, 60% in Brazil, bio-waste, we have uh, recovery of that. But more important than this European figure, you know that Brazil, of course, is rural areas, the Amazon, is Rio, is Sao Paulo, so it's way different. The same goes in, in the Netherlands. If you look at the Netherlands, there's lots of distinction between the various countries. On the left-hand side, you will see the recovery of um, materials in the north and uh, west of Europe, and here you see how much in eastern parts of Europe, the, the transition economies still, they're in a same, similar position as Brazil. Uh, the whole lot is being landfilled. So let's zoom in to these various strategies. These are the three types of, um, of where, uh, the, the three groups where European countries stand. Those who recycle mo uh, most, those who recycle a bit, uh, and uh, use some waste to energy, and those who are not in a position yet to recycle uh, and still landfill the most. Then what you see here, group one, group two, group three. Group two is interesting, that's for instance Italy. David was speaking about Italy. Um, Italy is divided in the north, which actually would do very well in group one, and the south of Italy, which is in group three still. So in countries still there is a difference, of course, when we, when we want to learn and improve our, our practice and we want to, walk, to move towards this green economy, uh, it's very interesting to zoom in to group one with the northwestern European countries who are performing in such a way that hardly any waste is being landfilled anymore and it's being recaptured, either the materials or the energy out of it uh, for the very most. If you look at the, at the outlook, we're still moving towards also uh, uh, the, exchange of uh, the exchange of knowledge and technology uh, in Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe is taking up its role. Poland, Romania, they are learning uh, in our European association about the technologies and the policies and the instruments that go with it. So if you then just look back, where do we stand now in Europe? Yes, do we do well as a recycling society today in Europe? Management of waste has improved. Many countries are recycling and recovering more and more, but also in Europe, more efforts are needed if Europe is to become a real recycling society. Still, the majority of waste, notably in the South and in uh, Eastern Europe, is sent to landfill. But an increasing amount is being recycled 
or incinerated and extracted the energy out of it. Whereas municipal waste, of course, the mixed municipal fraction is much more difficult than, than other um, uh, waste streams in, in construction and demolition waste. Um, we move from over 60% down to 40% uh, being landfilled, and the front runners are in the northwest of Europe. Thinking back about the material um, um, resources, you see also that we have moved to a more sustainable pattern of, um, of consumption. What happened is that um, we, when you look at our material, producti well, material productivity, you see here the increase of our um, economic wealth, our GDP, and what we do, the green line, with our material productivity. So we have economic development, but with less resources. I go fast, to you without, uh, you, fast with you uh, through the recycling potential. This is the potential of various waste streams and what recycling can contribute to the economic demand. It's increasing, it's doing better and better, but still, for, for important waste streams, the newer products, the plastics, the weeds, we need to do much and much better. If you look at the economic picture and the, um, uh, the turnover, recycling, just uh, prior to the crisis, did really, really well. Of course, then we were hit by the crisis, like any sector, but the recycling uh, part has had a huge increase in turnover and nearly doubled. If you then look at employment, same happened. From um, 400, uh, 22 inhabitants per million active in the recycling industry, we moved to over 600 in 2007. So that was an increase of nearly 50% of people being active in recycling activities. Okay, coming to the, um, to the planet again. This red line on the left shows you how we moved with our CO2 performance. And that has, done, that has been done mainly through these northwestern Western European uh, countries who compensate for the emissions that still take place elsewhere. So through regulation and investment in waste management, prevention, minimization, uh, the significant potential has been met already. We move from a emitter, a CO2 emitter, quite a, a significant one, to a net reducer at this moment in time. And we will reduce more and more in the future because recycling uh, is taken up more and more as our Secretary of State already showed. We in Europe meet 18% of our Kyoto Protocol targets through waste management and notably recycling, avoiding the emissions out of uh, uh, extracting of resource and such. It was UNEP who said that the unique posi uh, position of the waste sector is crucial to build on as a major saver of emissions in the future. This makes it clear even more so, the avoided emissions in, in Europe from municipal waste. So the quantification part. This is what our Secretary of State, of course, uh, spoke about. Our Utrecht professor, I'm sorry, I'm not the professor who can tell you all about the research. I will gladly answer your questions because, of course, I was involved in the, in the research. We had an IPCC laureate professor, um, scientific performance figures, and we had an up-to-date review of figures through the Abrelpe panorama, the waste data here in Brazil. Many thanks to Abrelpe for having collected these valuable data. Our Dutch association, which I'm the managing director, uh, NVRD, the Royal Dutch Waste Association, gave its inputs. And we translated the data towards energy um, uh, efficiency and then the CO2 impact for the municipal household waste, for the bulky waste uh, in our homes, and for the construction and demolition waste, which is, of course, crucial for economic development. If you look at, the, uh, at our production process from extraction of natural resources, Materials production, processing these, um, these materials, consumption, ending in the waste, into waste management as waste. Of course, you will see they will lead to CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. And those have been quantified. The CO2 emissions from energy in this process. In addition, we quantified the CO2 emissions from feedstock, fossil fuels, limestone, and from waste treatment. So we have the full picture of how... Um, our current uh, production process and our current waste management leads to CO2 emissions. And I will not bore you with the, the figures under the bonnet. I'll gladly leave that to the professor. But it was an impressive uh, studies with all quantified scientific uh, data. And we showed that in the Netherlands already, this is the current successful policy where we save half a million tons of CO2 per year. And we're moving towards even more recycling. And we will be uh, saving 2 million tons of CO2 emissions per year, each year. It leads to energy savings of 20 petajoules. 
annually, each year. Now, of course, we are a, a, a way smaller country than Brazil. So we took into account the, Brazilian, the baseline Brazilian scenario. 2030, suppose we have the same economic uh, process, but the economic growth that is uh, projected. We took into, into account the new Brazilian waste law, um, the draft goals on recycling, extraction of landfill gas out of the, uh, the landfill sites, and we also thought of a recycling plus scenario, using this technology that is available in Europe and taking it into account for uh, the immense Brazilian waste volumes and to compare the Dutch situation. What was the baseline? Currently, little se separation of recyclables, only 7% being recycled, over 90% being landfill. The waste law, two bin collection, white and dry recyclables, recyclables. That, for instance, in Rio here, is a huge challenge. With the high rise here close in Copacabana, but even more so in a favela or a community like Rosinha, it's, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be a real challenge, but the technology is there. And we also did the recycling plus scenario. And for the treatment part, little recycling, landfill open dump uh, now currently, we move to recycling of the dry, composting of the bio wastes, and the rejects uh, center landfill. That's uh, the waste law picture. If we move to a recycling plus scenario, where we do recycle all the dry recyclables, where we use the energy out of the, um, the bio waste, the 60% currently bio waste, and take it into anaerobic digestion and uh, the compost after, and the rejects don't go to landfill, but to waste to energy, um, this is what you get. Currently, the red, the landfill, the CO2 emissions uh, that go with it. The waste law scenario, if you look at the, at the various waste streams, what is possible in terms of recycling and the recycling plus scenario, suppose you would have hardly any landfilling anymore, as is done in our country. This is what would happen. This is the scenario of what's done in the wastes. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what comes up with it. The greenhouse gas emissions our Secretary of State spoke about. Now, 26 million tons of CO2 per year are being emitted here in Brazil. If we continue our economic process, it was accounted, we will nearly double it. Nearly double in 2030 if we don't do anything. The Brazilian waste law, if we recycle more as is envisaged, of course you will need the technology, the technology that is available, that is fundable, in, uh, in, uh, out, of, out of Europe, uh, already you would save 26 million tons. So what you emit currently, you could save it, uh, well, double it, uh, you'd be net savers of 26 million tons. But if you go to the full recycling scenario, 57 million tons would be uh, saved of CO2 emission reductions. That, as our Secretary of State said, accounts for one full month of Brazilian oil production savings. That's incredible, isn't it? To, make, to grasp it per inhabitant, uh, currently per capita, the CO2 emissions by our current production process taken to a landfill are over 100 uh, per, per person, and you can save 300 if you recycle and avoid all the emissions that go with the extraction of resources from the soil, uh, the production process, simply recycling. So it's possible to share uh, all the experience and the skills and technology, the waste collection, logistics systems, uh, the materials recycling facilities that are uh, available for the dry recyclables, the treatment of bio-wastes, David was talking about composting, as is done so very well in Italy too, uh, like it is done in the Netherlands, the new technology in anaerobic digestion uh, with energy recovering and composting, the waste to energy for the residual waste, um, and I'm nearly reaching the end. I, I see that I have one more minute to go through the money as David rightly said, the money. But, because, of course, it's nice to want to exchange knowledge and experience, but it has to be funded. If we look at the potential, we simply took into account the current CO2 market, the European uh, Euro, uh, trading system, and the current prices. Ten um, uh, dollar per ton. What, if you would apply this technology available right now, it would be over half a billion of US dollars already that you would get on the European market to account for these CO2 emission cuts. Of course, in the upcoming years, as the caps for the emitters will be uh, tightened, the prices for CO2 will go up. So if we take it to this 2030 scenario and we account for an increase of the price of the CO2 market, it is $1.7 billion that would become available through the CO2 market just as it is today. This is just the value, 
that is there now. But of course, apart from that, you also have your value on the market of the materials, the recyclables. They have their value, their price, their market price too. The energy that you get from the landfill gas extraction, from the waste to energy, uh, they have their energy price on the market too. So there are threefold uh, options to fund all the uh, exchange of, of knowledge that is there. This is an example of what ISWA does. Um, a prize-winning UN Habitat human settlement uh, program. So it's all available uh, and, and possible. Ideally, we would want to manage the whole chain of uh, co consumption and production. But hey, we're just active in the waste management industry, right? We can have a cost-cutting impact. We can go out throughout all these business sectors. So ideally, while we're here, all together in Rio uh, plus 20 with all these business sectors, we would want to have an alliance with all these sectors, um, governments, UNEP, UNDP, um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and we as ISWA, because we want to stimulate throughout these business sectors what can be done to get the materials back into the cycles and close the loops. We can actually turn the cradle-to-cradle -cradle principle into practice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we can do today. Um, we gladly look forward to the uh, cooperation that we all envisage. Uh, if you want to reach us, we can be reached at the ISWA headquarters in Austria. And uh, if you want to know more about the Dutch technology, NVRD office is available in the Netherlands. Many thanks for your attention. I look forward to your cooperation, and I wish you much inspiration.